Shall we pray? Lord, we worship you during this Christmas season. You are wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We choose to put you at the centre of our worship as we celebrate your birth. Keep us from distractions and help us to invite you into all our activity. Teach us to pray and help us to glorify you during this busy time of year. Give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation that we might know you better this Christmas. Help us to be kind and compassionate to one another and to those who are in need at this time of year. Help us to share your truth and be your light. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's good to be here. Thank you to the Oliver family for uh, their lovely start to the service. I missed part of it because I had to go out. There was someone came into the entrance porch, but uh, I'll have opportunity to watch it back on the video later, and so I'm sure that I'll enjoy it then. I was certainly being blessed prior to having to leave. And also thanks to, to Jim Sullivan for providing our nativity scene at the front of the hall this morning. It truly is beautiful, but if you want to ask him the story, it's maybe not as old as you might think. But uh, if you want to know the story, it involves a jelly baby Jesus as well. So you might want to ask him about that. But uh, we are here to worship, to worship that Christ child who is not simply a wooden statue, nor is he a jelly baby. He is the Christ, the Lord, the King of Heaven, the Saviour of the world, and so we're going to worship him. Hark the glad sound, the Saviour comes, the Saviour promised long, let every heart prepare a throne, and every voice a song. Let's stand together and let's sing our opening song. <laughs> treasures of his grace to enrich the humble poor, verses 3 and 4. Thank you. 
couple of the songs that we've got this morning, some folks may associate a little more with Easter tide rather than Advent and Christmas, that one being one of them, our glad hosannas, Prince of Peace, thy welcome shall proclaim. And it links in with that triumphal entry, yes, but it also links in with our hearts rejoicing at the coming of Christ, coming for us, though we did not deserve it, though we do not deserve his love, yet he comes. We're told that yet while we were still sinners, Christ came and Christ died for us. And if anything is there to gladden our hearts and cause us to sing hallelujah and to proclaim his welcome, the Prince of Peace, then surely that is one of those things. Just now, we're going to listen to the message from the songsters, after which we'll take up your offering. The songsters and then the offering.
comes from the book of Hebrews, or our first Bible reading at least does. It comes from the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, and starting at verse 1. The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshippers would have been purified once for all time, and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year, for it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins, that is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in the scriptures. First, Christ said, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them, though they are required by the law of Moses. Then he said, look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down in the place of honour at God's right hand. 
And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Amen. May God add blessing to that reading from his word. We're going to sing again. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us, let us find our rest in thee. We'll remain seated as we sing two songs together. Come, thou long-expected Jesus. We'll remain seated as we sing. <laughs>
I said, some of the songs that we're singing may be more associated with Palm Sunday, but as we prepare to welcome the Saviour, it surely is something to rejoice about. Now we're going to listen to the message from the singing company. And now we listen to that story of the child in a manger born. From Luke chapter 2. The Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their ancient towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea. David's ancient home. He travelled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no lodging available for them. Over time, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favour with God and all the people. And Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his public ministry. It was now the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, the Roman Emperor. Pontius Pilate was governor over Judea. Herod Antipas was ruler over Galilee. His brother Philip was ruler over Ituria and Trachonitis. Lysanias was the ruler over Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. At this time, a message from God came to John, son of Zechariah, who was living in the wilderness. 
And John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching that people should be baptised to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. Isaiah had spoken of John when he said, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. The valleys will be filled and the mountains and hills made level. The curves will be straightened and the rough places made smooth. And then all people will see the salvation sent from God. Amen. We sing again. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, proclaiming peace, announcing news of happiness, for our God reigns. Let's stand together and let's sing. <laughs> back again. Welcome once again fellow angelic beings and members of the heavenly host. This morning we continue our preparation for this very very special event, the operation that we have called named Nativity. This is the operation that shall see God's son, the Emmanuel, second person of the Trinity, the, and eternal high priest of all mankind, priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek, <laughs> uh, be born fully human to effect the Father's great salvation plan of love. Today we will hear an appeal that has been lodged by a member of the human race 
who feels he ought to have been invited, yet has not been. Annas, the high priest of the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, priests after the order of Aaron. Though he has not been invited to Operation Nativity, he will have a key role to play in the Operation Easter, though he does not know this yet. During Operation Easter, Annas will still be the legitimate high priest and president of Sanhedrin. Though by, the, by then, Caffius, the future son-in-law of Annas, will have been installed by the Roman occupiers as vassal puppet to masquerade and hold the sacred title. Yet it will still be to Israel's true high pr prize that the son's accusers must and will bring the Messiah before they eventually parade him in front of the so-called high priest, Caffius. It will therefore be Annas, whom you meet today, to set into motion the events that shall lead to the greatest of all violences, the slaughter of the Holy Lamb of God. As always, when these guests return to, the, to earth, they will have no recollection of these events up here in the heavens. So would you please welcome this morning's guest, Annas. Not a good start. I've no objection to telling you that I am utterly fuming. Totally enraged to think that the heavenly host could be so disrespectful to the God whom they purport to serve is beyond my comprehension. For to show even the slightest disrespect to me is to show the greatest disrespect to the Lord God. And then your error gets even worse by compounding it, by placing the blame upon the Lord God Most High for your own error in emitting my name from the event. This is perhaps the greatest blasphemy that I could imagine. To deny me my place at any event of significance is a slight against the office of the High Priest. It is a slight against God's chosen people. It is a slight against God himself. I am the one who stands before God on behalf of the people. And so it must therefore also follow that I am the one who stands before the people in his stead. I am his representative on earth. And so I insist that I be given my place. In the insinuation that was made when the news that I would not be invited to participate was utterly reprehensible. To try to play word games and claim that I, Annas, have misunderstood the nature of my role is contemptible. It simply proves that you do not understand my high status and my learning, for it is I and I alone who may fulfill the requirements of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. I and I alone may serve in the most holy place to make the atonement for my house and for the people. I alone can offer the sacrifices for the sins of the priests, of the people and of myself. And I alone can officiate at the sacrifices following a priest's consecration. Without me, without my blessing, there can be no priest of the order of Aaron. I and I alone may authorise priestly consecration, and I alone may direct priestly activity. It is my role to make the meal offering every morning and evening for the purity of the whole body of the priesthood. I am rightly and justly judged to be superior to all other priests in physique, in wisdom, in dignity and in material wealth. I am the steward of the Urim and the Thummim, the sacred symbols of light and perfection. And so I am by right God's oracle to and commander of the nation, arbiter of all revelation, all doctrine and all truth. 
Supreme ecclesiastical and religious authority lies within me, for I am chosen and appointed for life, according to the ancient scriptures, according and recorded in the scroll of the Numbers. It is my birthright. I am the chief priest. I am the high priest. It is my privilege and my burden, for I am the only one who ever gets to see God. I am the only one to go behind the curtain into the most holy place, the holy of holies, the inner sanctuary of God's temple, which contains the Ark of the Covenant, the stone tablets of Moses, the rod of Aaron and the jar of manna. Only I may go to a place where God dwells. Only I may ever approach the mercy seat of God, where God meets with mankind, not all, not sundry, only I have access to his mercy seat. The way to God is simply not open for all people, for all time. It is simply not open whether someone is Jew or Gentile. The way to God is not open whether you're male or female, not open whether you are slave or free. The way to God is through me, through my priests, for thus it has been. Thus it is now, and thus it shall always be, and forever shall remain. The veil in the temple stands as constant reminder that sin renders the rest of humanity unfit for the presence of God. It is there as a barrier to ensure that no man can carelessly or irre irreverently enter into God's awesome presence, and I will safeguard the sanctity of the Holy of Holies. I will ensure that nothing defiles it and that all honour is given to it. For if God is to visit mankind, then it will be in one place and one place only, behind that curtain. Nowhere else. That curtain exists for a purpose and I am its guardian. It was one thing for you to allow Zechariah to see one of your company, but we are now talking about so much more than simply meeting an angelic messenger. I will not, I must not be overlooked again. To fail to invite me is to place every aspect of your Operation Nativity in jeopardy, and I must be given a pivotal role. You may not realise, but my presence there will be needed to add credibility to this event in years to come. After all is revealed, the full meaning of the ancient prophecies surrounding this event will become clear to many. In those future days, there will be people amongst their generation who will seek to detract from the faith. And they will undoubtedly argue that it's inconceivable that the high priest would not have been there would not have understood the full meaning of those 18 prophecies of the advent, that the high priest of Israel would not be in attendance. For it is already foretold by Isaiah that the Emmanuel child shall be born of a virgin. Micah tells us that the event shall take place in Bethlehem, the ancient city of David. Through the scroll of Numbers, we also see that he shall be a Nazarite, from Genesis, we learn of the coming of a new Adam, seed of woman who shall crush the Satan's head, and it also tells that he shall be of the tribe of Judah. Indeed, Isaiah makes it even clearer that this great ruler shall be a descendant of Jesse, the father of Israel's greatest king. And Jeremiah tells us that it shall come to pass through David's line. Even if we did not have Daniel's prophecy, concerning the time of Messiah's arrival. Even if we did not have the prophecy telling how many generations it shall be from the time of Perez, even without the foretelling in the book of Numbers of the meaning of a new star in the heavens, we should still know that the time is close for the arrival of Messiah King, since the birth of his forerunner is already announced to Zechariah. And on a separate matter, I must also take exception to the sophistry which was used 
to justify my lack of invitation. Your argument that people are invited because God is good, not because they themselves are good, is a load of rubbish. Well, I don't quite mean that. It's true, obviously. Obviously it's true, and theologically I can understand that. But then I'm a sophisticated person. I can understand the nuance that you are using, but not everyone can. That is why we priests and learned folk keep such teachings apocryphal, hidden, if you will, for fear of confusing the average dullard in the synagogue seat, confusing them with knowledge and heavenly mysteries beyond the scope of their wit. We found that it's wise to direct their thoughts away from such matters, even though we who have sufficient aptitude and schooling can see them clearly written across the pages of our scripture as a soteriological thread of love onto the law. But it's more suited to the limited capacity of the average man, and it ensures the continuity of our religion. It smooths the way, you see, if they've been cajoled into obedience, not merely to the law of Moses, but also into obedience to those who interpret the law. And we do so terribly well. Into just 613 commands and a few mere additional handfuls of simple rules for living about which we are the sole arbiters. The people soon learn that if they transgress, they can come and buy a sacrificial animal from one of my authorised temple vendors. And they can buy it with temple money, exchanged by one of my temple money changers. And they can pay one of the priests, my priests, to make an appropriate sacrifice. It's all quite simple, really. It works. And their malleable obedience to us seems to placate our Roman masters. Yes, God is good, everyone knows that, but we maintain that as a romantic, a, a philosophical notion, if you will, not a practical one. You see, there needs to be an incentive for people to be good themselves, so we simply choose not to dwell on it too much. Their feeble minds and souls would get befuddled. As high priest, I feel it's my duty to inform you that I believe people will take this Operation Nativity the wrong way and will start to believe that God loves sinners. They'll start to believe that he still loves them, even while they are sinners. That he's coming to earth in order to meet sinners and to appeal to them like some sort of heavenly doctor. And pretty soon, some idiot will start to get the idea that God loves the whole world, Gentiles included. And again, theologically, I can understand that the Lord Almighty is the one true God, the Lord of all the world, but I must insist that we Jews maintain our rightful place and identity as God's chosen people. For is it not plain for all to see, for all to know, and for all to understand that God so loved the nation of Israel that he sent his only begotten words that whosoever of his chosen people that shall follow it shall not perish but have eternal life? And it's for that reason that I insist that I must be given my rightful place as guardian of that word and leader of those chosen people. Of course, I don't do so for selfish reasons. Nothing could be further from the truth. I do so for the purposes of maintaining the dignity of God's chosen people, for the sake of my office and in order to safeguard the holy name of God. But I will not have that place threatened and any who do so any who claim to have a role which supersedes mine as high priest, they will answer to the fullest extent of the law, whether that be God's law by stoning or be the law of the Romans by flogging and crucifixion. I will not have it. Please be assured that I have the strength of stomach that my role requires and I will do my duty and stamp it out, no matter how distasteful it may seem to others. I am the high priest of the order of Aaron, and I can trace my roots back 
through Zadok himself, the leading priest to Aaron himself, the first high priest of Israel, an elder brother of Moses. I am charged with the spiritual welfare of God's people, a sacred duty. Therefore, if God is indeed to come and meet mankind, then I must be the first to welcome him in his great temple, for it must be there, and I will then act as gatekeeper and regulate access and control the way. For without me to prepare the way, there would be no one to welcome him to his great throne. There'd be no one to emerge from behind the curtain with a glowing face to testify that I had been in the presence of the Almighty One. There'd be no one to give witness that God had come without me. Well, you might as well simply hold court in a stable, sit or lie on a bale of hay and allow unclean shepherds or even worse, foreigners bearing gifts of homage to come. And what a disaster that would be.
truth of the gospel is that Christ did not come just for one people. He did not come simply for the priests. He came for the world. He didn't come to make us obedient. He came that we might believe in his love. That we might not perish, but have everlasting life. The message of the cradle is that he didn't come behind a great curtain so that we could not have access. He came in a stable open to all. He came to a place where unclean shepherds, like Adniel we thought of week one, could come and meet him. He came to those who would be outcast, who others despised and looked down upon. He came for you, and he came for me. He came for the whosoever. So let us pray. Father God, we thank you that you came, held court in a stable, sat on a bale of hay, that you allowed unclean shepherds, that you allowed foreigners to come. We thank you that our heritage does not matter. We thank you that the past can be laid aside for you come to offer forgiveness. So as we continue our journey towards Christmas, may we spread the joyful news that Christ has come. Amen. And our closing song says... Whosoever heareth, shout, shout the sound. Send the blessed tidings all the world around. Spread the joyful news wherever man is found, that whosoever will may come. Let's stand together, sing our closing song. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.